I'm so excited to see this many people get up at 8.30 in the morning. That's wonderful. Um, so uh, we are all digital archaeologists is an increasingly common refrain amongst uh, practitioners today. However, the ubiquity of computational approaches in archaeology uh, maybe still seems little understood. Debates about the philosophical or cultural dimensions of digital technologies in the discipline have a very deep legacy, yet the technical capacities of these tools still tend to eclipse meaningful critique of their implications. Problematically, as I think probably everyone here would agree, it is usually the applications of computers that become the overwhelming <laughs> focus of digital archaeological of digital archaeological discussions at our conferences, in our written work, and in our classrooms, uh, too. This trend to value the technical above the theoretical is one that's seen across many fields. Uh, and it's made worse by the fact that it tends to betray itself again and again as any new piece of gear is added into our various disciplinary toolkits. And the CAA enterprise itself hints at the predicament because applied methodology is foregrounded in the organization's very name. But uh, closer interrogation of the history and the present of digital practice in archaeology suggests a huge wealth of critically engaged and theoretically progressive work in the discipline. As an introduction to Digitag, then, we want to suggest that digital archaeologists are therefore doing themselves a bit of a disservice by not explicitly positioning, positioning themselves at the forefront of our larger discipline of archaeology. We can drive forward archaeological theory overall. As we will make clear, digital archaeologists have been driving methodological adva advancement in archaeology for more than a half century now. Yet we still do not seem to have the rubrics in place to force larger theoretical shifts. We aim, therefore, to use Digitag to begin identifying the gaps and tensions uh, which are hampering our capacities to write contemporary and future archaeological theory. These challenges include everything from standard modes of disseminating our academic papers to CAA's seeming lack of voice in interdisciplinary affairs. For instance, where is the CAA's code of ethics? Where is its press releases in response to matters of wide public concern? as many other major organizations like the World Archaeological Congress, the Society for American Archaeology, etc., uh, do. Uh, Costa Stalis has clearly outlined the bigger problem, writing that, quote, questions of huge impact to archaeological theory and practice during the last half st century, stemming from post-colonial, feminist, indigenous, Marxist, and hermeneutic approaches, appear to be peripheral in the literature, subject matter, and interests of digital archaeology. Building on the work of Dallas and many others, we will argue that we appear to be lacking a larger critical disciplinary framework to guide digital practice. To make our case, we'll begin by looking in depth Oh, thanks. <laughs> At another di discipline that's been wrestling uh, with uh, comparable issues in an effort to learn from the experiences of others. So James will take us through a deconstruction of the development of critical uh, GIS, and then he will link it to general development of hardware and software and their application across the discipline of archaeology specifically. We will, from there, connect these ideas to the history of critical thinking in digital archaeology, testifying to the long genealogy of such work. As James will hint, where things appear to destabilize uh, is at those moments when new technologies are added into our practice, because our, arguably they are they are being introduced into a system that doesn't, in most cases, purposefully and always or ever force critical attention on their socio-technical dimensions. I will go on to review current critical theory in digital archaeology in order to make the case to you, sorry, that, um, that we already have the infrastructure in place to design and roll out a discipline-wide reflexive theory for the digital age in archaeology. We will conclude then by arguing that our challenge is to make this happen and hence put digital archaeologists at the center of theorizing in the dis discipline rather than systematically and continuously relegated to the sidelines. So I'll pass it over to James. Thank you. Um, right, so I'm just going to step sideways out of discipline for a bit and I want to talk a bit about, almost really as a case study, I think, um, the emergence of, of 
critical thinking in, in uh, uh, geography, um, and particularly in GIS practice in geography. Um, if you look at that at, at, at that subject, there have been three ways of three waves of emergent uh, critique of GIS and related technologies um, within the sphere of geography over the last 20 years or so, all rooted in a kind of postmodern um, standpoint, I suppose. The first wave focusing upon critiquing the positivist roots of the technology and highlighting its sort of quantitative focus, while at the same time calling for a need for GIS to incorporate sort of non-cartographic spatial knowledge. And forgive me if a lot of you guys are familiar with this, but I think it's worth recapping a little bit um, before we move on. Also, um, like post-processionalism, really, it was, uh, it was uh, calling into question the sort of top-down hierarchies of, uh, the, and the power dynamics of GIS and its application within the discipline, um, accusing it of being exclusive and um, technologically elite, undemocratic, um, being developed off the back of military applications and big software companies and so on, and disempowering for all of the above reasons. Later on, a sort of second wave of critique, uh, of critical engagement with these issues, um, again really paralleling post-processual thought in our own discipline, started to make attempts to solve or, or challenge these characterizations by bringing in a sort of range of theoretical paradigms to GIS-related GIS research. And this included notably um, uh, a sort of an emergence of feminist geography and qualitative GIS, um, which promoted mixed methods and, uh, in uh, geographical research with a focus upon qualitative data in GIS. And these critical GIS practitioners began to ask and to try to answer conceptual and epistemological questions about GIS and the way in which it helps to produce knowledge. More recently, critical GIS has evolved again, and in an effort to directly address issues of empowerment and democratise uh, the process of knowledge creation and production, another subdiscipline has, known, has emerged known as participatory GIS. And this trend advocates bottom-up community-based GIS practice aimed to encourage positive social change from local production of geographic knowledge at the community level. Um, and this has recently began to become known, I suppose, as a kind of neo-geography, um, the agenda of which aligns with recent academic and political interests with the concepts of big data and, uh, and big society and the local voice and such like. Um, so together, these kind of key components and the associated theoretical discourse within geography have led to the evolution of a broader disciplinary bubble um, <coughs> within that subject, which has become known as GI science, I think it's fair to say. And this critical framework has resulted in some very interesting left field and intellectually challenging applications of GIS in recent years. Um, uh, and there's plenty, I haven't put any examples in, but there's plenty of examples um, around if you, if you look for them. So coming back to archaeology, um, <laughs> I think it's interesting to note the parallels of this critique, again, both in its timing and its substance with the emergence of post processual the post-processional school in archaeology, both being rooted in a disciplinary level postmodern critique. However, it's also worth noting, I think, that if you scan the literature on GIS in archaeology, it's not commonly or explicitly cited in archaeological literature, although there are some very notable exceptions to this, many of which do attend the CIA, and one of which, Pirea Hajgazela, who was going to talk on this this afternoon, but sadly can't, can't make it for personal reasons. So it, it is there, but it's not necessarily that commonly recognised by practitioners in archaeology. More importantly, um, despite some very interesting applications of more qualitative GIS in archaeology, there's been no equivalent systematic critique um, equivalent to GI science, really, within, um, within archaeology of the application of uh, geospatial technologies within the discipline, although maybe 
others would care to debate that. Um, McCoy and uh, Ladafoga in 2009 neatly summarized the fact, pointing out that early on in the application of GIS, for many years the subject of spatial technology and archaeology had been likened to the law of the hammer in that the appeal of technology has caused excessive gratuitous application or pounding without regard to purpose, appropriateness or theory. Um, which is it? Uh, an interesting statement, um, but then they go on to argue that that balance is being addressed, this is in 2009, highlighting links to strong theoretical developments in landscape archaeology which aim to use spatial technologies to solve um, archaeological problems rather than just being led by the data, and trends at the disciplinary level towards teaching spatial techno technological practitioners the fundamental principles that drive the technology and linked to that is a sort of increasing technological savviness within the discipline, I suppose, pertaining to the strengths and limitations of these technologies. More recently, in 2012, Mark Gillings paints a rather more bleak picture of the relationship between GIS and theoretical discourse, highlighting what he perceives as being a dysfunctional or even irreparable schism between GIS practitioners and landscape theorists. Um, in doing so, he seeks to build upon an established body of critical work in applied GIS to consider how the innovative and critical use of spatial technologies can serve to generate and nurture new theoretical approaches. So I'm not sure I'd necessarily agree with him that it's we need to give up on a right, wider theoretical dialectic, but ultimately I would argue that the end goal of this is the same, that everybody really wants a more critically engaged, theoretically driven application of technological methods within the GIS subdiscipline of archaeology. So, um, of course, I've been looking, focusing on GIS because that's a bit of what I know and, and um, the digital turn, as it were, in archaeology stands far beyond the application of GIS and spatial technologies and includes a whole range of quantitative methods and statistical approaches and applied computational technologies which can be linked both to the development of software and to developments in hardware. So we see increasingly LiDAR, drones, 3D modelling, whether that be laser scanning or structure from motion, space archaeology, hyperspectral cameras, tablet technologies, participatory practice, curation, digital curation, social media being used and talked about, um, as well as increasingly efficient and more accurate, in inverted commas, traditional technologies such as GPS or total robot robotic total stations and so on. Um, and the development and application of which are very well documented just within the, the proceedings of this conference. Um, Archaeology is more driven than ever, I think, to experiment with these technologies both in and out of the field. And historically speaking, <laughs> if we can see a groundswell of theoretically grounded critical self-awareness in the application of spatial technologies, as I've just said, um, Often, I think, it appears virtually non-existent in wider discourse pertaining to the application of emergent commute, computing technologies in archaeology. Or is it? At least it seems buried within more specific results-driven, techni technologically oriented papers and presentations. Or effaced completely, perhaps not recognised as part of the same dialogue. I don't know. The danger is that digital the danger that digital archaeology come the danger is sorry that digital archaeology might come across or digital archaeologists might come across as a sort of neo processionalism um, so for better or for worse depending on your point of view of course um, but I'm not saying, and it would be wrong to suggest, that people we don't theorise our digital methods. In fact, there's a long, when we scratched the surface and started reading and thinking about digital tag, we realised there's a really, there's a long history of theoretically grounded critique, evaluation and data synthesis among digital practitioners. And some of these volumes, I mean, these volumes are just the tip of the iceberg, really. Particularly the Evans and Daly volume, which is born out of a similar tag session in 2000 called Archaeological Theory for a Digital Past. A quick scan of this volume reveals a wide variety of papers, ranging from a historiographical overview of digital archaeology, consideration in a, in a strangely prescient of this own conference's theme of oceans of data, there's a, a, a piece in there about mountains of digital data that need to be 
archive without a clear understanding of its end purpose. Um, there's also synthesis of higher order theoretical concepts, of gender and identity from statistical analysis and modeling of real world problems, exploration of the implications of environmental modeling, landscape visualization, and considerations of the issues of scale, which are then taken on in a, in a different themed volume, which often has a lot of digital implications itself. The impact of 3D visualization on understanding of archaeology and other papers on how digital information might be disseminated. It's all there. Um, the point is that critically and theoretically engaged discussion is there. It's always been there, basically. So we got thinking about this and throughout the presentation of my section of this paper anyway, we... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, we'll give it a try. <laughs> We've been <laughs> no, I'm completely thrown, but it's a good point to be thrown. I've been, I've been constantly reminded of a review that I wrote for a peer peer review blog um, called Then Dig in 2013 which was considering a piece by Stuart Eve um, who also sadly couldn't be here today reflecting his own research interests in mixed augmented reality um, in, in archaeology and the heritage sector. And this is the first time I was introduced to the uh, Gardner hype cycle for emerging technologies, which illustrates how technologies can be adapted over time. And the cycle builds upon the idea that after its technological trigger, um, emergent technology moves through a hype of a hype peak of inflated expectations and into a trough of disillusionment having been overhyped and and then knocked for over for, for being overhyped and then after the hype dies down it it moves through a slope of enlightenment to a plateau of productivity as the real potential of technology is explored and applied to real world problems this is the 2015 Gartner hype cycle and for me it resonates with the way in which archaeology utilizes its technological solutions and it's interesting to note although I have no quantitative uh, backup for this but there appears to be some kind of correlation between this hype cycle and the degree and again this is something we can discuss between this hype cycle and the degree of critical engagement with a technological solution and in part this is probably to do with the age or the time it's taken for a technology to mature. Maturing technologies like GIS um, or, and statistical methods, which notably I couldn't find on the hype cycle when I looked for them, they probably live somewhere out in the plateau of productivity and off, off the hype cycle completely. Um, but they have been around long enough for a strong body of critical literature to emerge in relation to it. However, I wonder if there's more to it than just simply length of service or maturity. I think there might be something about the way that technology is critiqued as it descends into its trough of disillusionment that forms a fertile catalyst for renewed reflective and critical engagement, which ultimately plateaus out into a healthy and productive theoretical discourse. Somewhere around there. Sorry, I'm supposed to click that. <laughs> um, from my perspective as a field archaeologist, Excavation practice has seen waves of applied technological methods um, and solutions to problems, some of which we didn't always know that we had, um, relating to the whole archaeological process from data acquisition and recording to data management and analysis. And this has happened at Chattel Hook, um, which where I work with my colleagues here. Um, and. Uh, Chattelhook has a long history of adopting emergent technologies as part of its broader reflexive ethos. Oh <laughs> <Shit. Wow. laughs> so, <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> okay, okay. So, <laughs> as part of the research, Chattelhook research project, our most recent focus has been on tablet recording and digital protocols for tablet recording and 3D data acquisition in the field. Um, 3D technologies are typical of the issue because um, within this conference the majority of papers given on 3D methods are predominantly technical and focus on specifications, accuracy, precision and sort of look at the size of my point cloud. This may relate to the relative maturity of 3D tech. We know that, that structure for motion has been around for ages but arguably it should have a strong body of critique. 
by now, right? But in reality, it hasn't been freely available in a practical sense at a disciplinary level for more than five or six years. And when you compare that with the 30 odd years of development of GIS, um, you know, which is, um, we might argue that 3D tech has a way to go before this critical literature emerges. The difference at Chapel Hook, I would argue, is that these technologies are adopted as part of a mature, critical, and critically self-aware framework from the outset, wherever it sits on the hype cycle. So however new that technology is, there's always a team which are constantly reviewing the rationale for adopting these technologies and asking why we should use it or what we can use it, what it can do for us. And I'm really sorry, Sarah, you've got about uh, one, 30 seconds uh, to get through to the slide. <laughs> so I, um, I spent the last couple of weeks reading hundreds of articles <laughs> that have been published in the last few years around uh, critical uh, digital practice. And I apologize for the very heavy uh, duty slide uh, here. Um, but I put on it the articles that I think are the most, that's OK, uh, <laughs> inspiring. Uh, these all, I think, reinforce the long history of critical digital practice. And what is important is that when you start to kind of deconstruct these articles, so go through them point by point, what are they, what are they trying to say? All of them actually do converge on the same set of ideas. Although it's interesting that it's somewhat rare for them to cite one another within these articles. There's only a few people that usually cite one another, and a lot of people aren't cited at all. So for the most part, um, these papers Papers, whether explicitly or implicitly, make the case for digital archaeologists designing systems and infrastructure that enable or indeed force forms of criticality. And in the best cases, so the best ones of these articles, they actually have a case study attached. So you can see how they've gone about forcing criticality. So when you put it all together, this is how I take it. Um, these articles variously speak of developing workflows that purpose purposefully foster through their digital mechanisms, slowness, time for reflexivity and introspection. They talk about crafting systems that embrace complexity rather than trying to standardize things, that value data specificity rather than trying to wash over this in the hopes of generalizing. They talk about protecting, as, as Cooper and Green put it, the character the character full nature of digital data. They talk about studying the derivation of data and infosystems themselves, their temporal and relational qualities, their histories of production and circulation. They talk about, and these are the ones I find the most fascinating, reconfiguring our graphical user interfaces and other modes of publication and, uh, and engagement in order to reframe the research process. They talk about prioritizing and designing reward systems for creativity, the creation of unusual, inspiring, innovative outputs that go beyond mere replication. They talk about draw, developing models of practice that draw explicit attention to the moral, aesthetic, political, and structural implications of the data and their architecture. And they talk about using co-production and forms of public engagement to, as Stuart Jeffrey puts it, quote, mitigate the weirdness of the digital object. Some of the most exciting projects by individuals like Rachel Opitz, Alice Watterson, Colleen Morgan, Stu Eve, Stu Jeffrey, uh, and Tara, Tara Cobblestone are centered on creating digital interventions that not only advance archaeological research and method, but force us through their various technical interventions to think differently about what archaeologists, what archaeology as a broad field of practice is and what it can be. It's not exclusively focused on the digital. Clearly, then, there is room to argue that digital archaeologists aren't deeply, aren't deeply involved you can't make that argument, as people are often doing, that digital archaeologists aren't really thinking critically about archaeological practice. And yet we, as much as anyone, are guilty of throwing out the accusation uh, that we're a, a theoretical. So what's going on? I realize I have no time. So, so I will um, uh, just make a skip over some notes and just make a couple of last points. I think the first thing is, is that one might argue that critique of the lack of critique in digital archaeology is leading to fatigue or 
exasperation with the situation. And as Andre Kostopoulos puts it, these pro problems aren't new. They're not unique to digital archaeology or even characteristic of digital archaeology. They belong to archaeology as a whole. And in his inaugural ar article to the new journal Frontiers in Digital Archaeology, he very clearly asserts his frustrations when he writes, I want to stop talking about digital archaeology. I want to continue doing archaeology digitally. <laughs> Clearly, that's my, my cue to stop. And he goes on to confess that he's ashamed of the field of practice uh, overall, saying, I must admit I'm embarrassed at the public expense involved in the numerous rather sterile meetings in which I've participated about the digital turn in archaeology and the setting up of public arch archives, community GIS, etc., for what I consider very little results. The carbon footprints of some of these meetings must have been stupendous, but I do not think the expense so far has been justified by the outcomes. Perhaps unwittingly, Kostopoulos hints here at some of the very issues that doing archaeology digitally has often failed to address. Its financial burdens, its unequal development, deployment based on geography, education, ethnicity, language, its implication in structural violence and structural inequality, its gender dimensions, its environmental impacts, carbon footprint, uh, and more. So I'll skip over and go straight to the end and say that we believe that in doing uh, digital archaeology and in recognizing the very many people, in particular some others that I haven't addressed already, Lorna Richardson, who hopefully will be here uh, later, Pyre, you've already mentioned, Ruth Tringham and others, we believe that we can provide a, a more cohesive, reflexive model for the digital age in archaeology. We are in the position to lead archaeological theorization. We do not need to be the final chapter of the textbook. Uh, we do not need to be the subject matter that's relegated to medium-specific journals or to conference proceedings. The CAA can be the go-to point for the discipline overall. So we'd like to use Digitag to articulate the steps by which this can come into being. Can we write a rubric for reflexive archaeology in the digital age that all archaeologists can use as their go-to point for reflexive practice now? And can we use the CAA to do this and drive just disciplinary change overall? So we look forward to exploring these issues with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, and